being humble, being coachable, and having a desire to self-improve with no external motivation. Because if someone's got to push you to do it, then you, you don't really want to do it. What's going on guys? This is Brian from Investment Hockey Advising here. And today we have a really cool interview here with AHA's very own lead advisor, Dave DeChevy. Now for those of you who don't know Dave, he's part, he's been the, the original founder with me of um, Advancement Hockey Advising here. And also he plays pro hockey out in Europe and he's had uh, quite an extensive pro career now in the minor leagues. You know, I met Dave back at uh, Western New England when I played NCAA D3 hockey there for a couple years. And he was there as a sophomore when I came in as a freshman. So me and Dave go way back. We work very closely together and I think you guys can get a lot of value out of this interview here that we're gonna have together so if you guys do like this kind of content if you do want to see more interviews like this here consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell so you never miss another video and if you like it absolutely destroy that like button it really goes a long way for the algorithm here and to help other people see this content so without further ado here let's dive right into our interview with Dave DeChevy all right so we got David DeChevy here on board how you doing today Dave doing well Pearl. how are you I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. All right. So I guess we'll dive right into it here. So why don't you tell the viewers uh, a little bit about yourself and uh, your hockey career in general? I'm the lead advisor with, uh, with AHA. I've been around since, you know, you started the company, you brought me on board and we've been building it up to now and uh, it's been going great. That's currently my professional position. And then in terms of my hockey career, I started playing when I was, um, when I was five years old. You know, my parents put me in figure skating at the age of three, which was probably the best thing they could have ever done. Grew up like any other, any other kid in Toronto, you know, going through the minor system. And then we decided to go down to the U.S. for prep school for a year and then came back, played junior in Ontario, got a NCAA D3 commitment from there. And then after that, the um, after I graduated there, then we started looking towards the, the minor professional career, which, you know, I'll get into as, as we go. Yeah, for sure. Now you mentioned figure skating. I never knew that about you actually. Can you talk a bit more about that? Like why, why that's the best thing that uh, your parents could have done? Because if you look at the amount of kids nowadays that are, you know, maybe 15 to 18 that still don't have that good stride, you learn those techniques when you're younger. And, you know, I always look at guys like, I don't know, Jeff Skinner, even Kale McCarr, McDavid, McKinnon, all those guys can, their, their stride is unbelievable. And you learn that not through power skating with a puck, but through the technical stuff that might be a bit more boring at first, but it pays off so much in the long run. And I seriously credit my abilities to skate from starting there for two years without a stick in my hand. Yeah. I wish I would have done figure skating. Cause man, I, I can attest to this guys. Uh, Chevs is uh, quite, quite the skater. He's probably the fastest guy out there on the ice. So um, yeah, that's a good pro tip for people. If mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're well, watching, if you want to put your kids in figure skating, I'd say that's probably a good idea when they're young. So uh, I want to transition a little bit. So, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, you play college, obviously we played together for a couple of years and uh, then you transitioned to pro. Can you dive into more in that process as to, you know, how you go from the college level and how you transition to pro? Cause a lot of players ask a lot of questions about it. There's not that much info out there. So could you dive in more um, into that? The pro world coming from college as a D three player is a little different than as a D one guy. So the way I look at pros, you divide it into, into tiers. If you're a good NCAA, NCAA D1 player, then, you know, you're looking at some of the higher leagues. Maybe you can crack a, a top league in one of the lower known countries, like let's say, you know, Norway, Denmark, France, Italy, for example, maybe even Austria, if you're up there. And then as you grow in those, in those systems, then you start to get to the higher leagues or those D1 guys go play, you know, ECHL or AHL to start in America, build a resume and then go over to the top leagues in Europe. That's another strategy. But for the guys playing D3, there's, you know, I get a lot of questions on our Instagram too. You see it. And I think there's a big misconception with what you really need to get there. And the times have changed a lot, especially when coaches in Europe see different things. So as a D3 player, if you have adequate points, like maybe half a point a game, for example, and a decent video, you can get to Europe and make, you can make some pocket money to live. You probably won't make money to sustain yourself for your entire life, but you'll get your apartment paid for some expenses, your equipment, maybe a meal a day. And then your salary generally, from what I've seen from not only working with coaches, but then getting paid. I mean, you can range from getting $0 all the way to maybe 
I don't know, upwards of a thousand if you're really good per month. And if you do well, then of course, teams will start offering you more. They'll see that your resume is building and then you, you build your portfolio from there. But in terms of the lower end D3 guys and maybe even the top junior guys or the club hockey guys that want to go, you might need to expect that your first year over there, you're not going to get paid. Yeah, you may think, oh, I deserve to get paid. No, you don't. Because someone's spending money on you for a job. And if you go over there and for myself, for example, I started in the federal league, which is, you know, the lowest level in the U S and then I left to go to Europe. The first year they, they didn't have a salary for players. It was just your expenses were covered. Once you perform and start doing better, then the next year they talk about money with you because they see your value and, and they see that you're, you're worth the money that they're going to spend on you because their budgets are not as big as the higher professional leagues. That's it. You have to, like, you have to have the mindset, like you have to provide value to the team. And if you're coming from a, a lower end, like ACHA program, junior program that's not super high up there, you know, just a regular junior program or even lower end and steadily D3 program, you don't have that many points or whatever, then you gotta, mm. you gotta know that it's for a team, like it's a business, right. And you want to win. So you have to like, you want to get players that are going to provide the most value possible and they're only going to pay you if you provide that value. So that's kind of exactly. like the mindset that you have to have. Would you say that starting like, like you did for, for us and Canadian guys, if do you think it's a better strategy to start in the fed and build your resume and then go to Europe? Or do you think going to Europe first is the best strategy? I think it depends where you are. I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. The fed, I don't want to dive into the fed because it's its own league. And if you know, the league, it's got its own reputation. Not to say it's bad hockey, but in Europe, it's not viewed as as good as it as it is. Okay. So your options are, you know, if you're a lower end guy trying to go to Europe, maybe accept your first year that you won't get a salary. But teams are still technically paying for you to go there. You know, the apartment can cost three to five hundred a month. Your transfer card costs a thousand in every country. That's a whole different thing. Your meals can cost, you know, a hundred bucks a week for them if they're paying for it. Your equipment, and so the team's still spending money on you to be there. So they're investing in you, but then if they want to spend that extra money for you to play, you have to show them that you can play Gotcha. because of the higher leagues. I've seen guys get fired. You know, if, if you're not performing, why are they going to spend all that money on you? Mm. So it's a matter of getting there, you know, proving yourself and then being able to earn that money down the road. For the most part, trying to go to straight to Europe may be the, the better strategy. I mean, I guess it, I guess it depends on each individual player, but uh, yeah, it's to Europe might be better. Okay. It depends. In my opinion, if you can get to the SPHL after you're playing D3, that'll provide you with a better resume to get to Europe. If not, if you're starting in a Europe league, that's too low, then you really have to work your way up. Like my, my path, I've gotten a couple good bounces and some good luck along with, you know, having a passport, a European passport, which helps out a lot. Yep. So that's yeah. important. Just, just so for, I yeah. know you just mentioned it, having a passport, if you can, that really gives you a good in because you're not considered an import, right? If you have a, uh, no, that's, you are. Okay. you are an import, but what the passport does in a, in a low league, if for example, you're only making 400 bucks a month, like the team's only paying you that, that doesn't qualify for a visa, like a work visa. So all these top pro guys, they're on athlete visas. So it's registered by, by the club in the government but if you're going there and you have a european passport you can stay there as long as you want because without the passport then there's a bunch of rules they change all the time but you may have to leave the country and come back and that's more money out of your pocket for flights and then it's still a little bit iffy with that i've seen some horror stories of guys a guy in sweden he he went home for christmas came back and they didn't let him back in because he overstayed his holiday visa yeah and so they had to ship his equipment back home like a disaster Oh my God. Okay. Um, so it's with that, it's a, it's a tricky area. So having the passport is just like a plus for, for yeah. yourself and for, for the teams too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so just transitioning a, a little bit away from the pro. So why don't you like compare your junior hockey experience with your college hockey experience and then your pro hockey experience, just like a quick, uh, you know, maybe 30 second segment on each, like the, the different mm -hmm. styles and all that, that type of stuff. Yeah. So junior, I played in the, in the OJHL, the Ontario league. It was good back then. It, you know, we were allowed to wear visors. Now they can't. So it was a little more, a little more fun with that. The hockey was good. You get a mix of guys on different teams. For example, our team had maybe three to four Div 1 commitments. And then the rest of us filtered out in Div 3, like the older guys. And then, of course, some lower end, or not lower end, some younger OHL players. So the league was good overall. I really enjoyed it. It was structured. Everyone took it serious. It was very competitive. Uh, when I moved into college, that was where that was where I really saw that the strength was a big thing. 
Like I'm not a very tall guy and coming in a junior, I wasn't like as strong as I was at the end of college. So I noticed like off my first phase, I'm like, wow, these guys are unbelievably strong. And the exactly. game, you notice it too, right? <laughs> yeah, so I know. It's a smaller guy, yeah. you notice it. So strength was a priority right away after that game. The speed of the game changes. Like the skill level is, the skill level was a little similar to junior. You're just dealing with bigger guys that play faster. Yeah. So it was a lot of um, run and gun hockey, as I call it. You know, you dump it in, you chase it down. D1, I went to watch a, a couple games. It's a little more skill-based and it's fast, but they still play the run and gun system as well. Yeah. So college hockey was definitely the, that was the most competitive that I played. 100%. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Because I know for me too, it was like strength, speed, decision-making was quicker in college. You know, it was all like very, very fast paced and very competitive. Mm-hmm. That's what yeah. I got. And the lineups in college too, like if you have a 30 man roster, you got to battle for it. You remember there was, we had guys fighting in practice just to get their spot in the lineup. Not that that's the way to earn it, but if they have to do something, then that'll get them in the door. Yeah, for sure. And then oh, in Europe, it's a little different. Every country is different. Like, so I played Sweden Div 3 and Div 2. Division 2 in Sweden was the most comparable to NCAA. It was a little bit better passing and a little less physical or less hitting per se then spain was the lowest level but the best fan base they 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 whistle like soccer players at you so it was kind of it was kind of fun like that that's awesome and then italy was so i played two years in the second italian league and then i did some preseason with the higher leagues so my league i'd say was a lower level than division three ncaa but the import players were a lot better and they raised the game Mm, so that was that then when I played the preseason in the Alps, it was, uh, it felt like really good division three hockey, like top level, like you're a national championship. Like that's the kind really? of players. Okay. Yeah. And then I played one game in the ice HL, which is like the Italy, Austria, um, Czech league. And that was just a whole different world. Like, was it like very good or was it, uh... it was, um, it was amazing. It's like, you think you're fast for one day and then you skate there and you're like, okay, you're average. <laughs> Everyone can skate. They don't miss passes. They're big. They can skate as fast with the puck as they can without. That was like the top kind of pro, I guess, experience I had in one game. Because you've got imports coming from the AHL. There's guys on our team with NHL games and you're seeing it. And it gives you a good perspective as to not only where I was at as a hockey player, but what actually is out there in these higher leagues and what you need to do to be good. Yeah. So when you see these imports in these top European leagues getting you know, 50, 60 points. It's, it's really impressive yeah. because the hockey is, is solid. Yeah. It must be cool playing with those guys. eh? like, to... it was, it was a learning experience. It was a lot of fun. I played, uh, you know, I, I guess I had two games with that team and uh, who HC Pusatal on the ice. And that was, um, and it was great. I didn't, it was a good luck opportunity. And, uh, and you learn a lot in, in those two games you play. All right. So transitioning now to advising. So you've been playing pro, you know, you've, you went through college, you know, you've been playing pro and then in the middle of your, your pro hockey career, I think I, uh, I approached and said, Hey, do you want to start uh, doing some advising here? So can you talk a little bit more about that as to how you kind of got into it and then mm-hmm. and why you're, you're still doing it today? The reason I'm still doing it. And the reason I tell like prospective clients why I'm still doing it is because I've had some, I've had a couple good experiences with advisors in the past and some really bad ones. Yeah. So the main issue that I've seen people complain about or myself as well is lack of communication with advisors and honesty. So I'm not, I'm obviously not going to name drop, but I had advisors who, you know, my parents would pay, we'd create a contract with them. And on my first call, they tell me, granted, I was 18 years old in prep school. They're like, hey, you got to call the, the schools. You got to do this work that we're paying you. And you're telling me to do your job. Or then you don't hear from the guy for a week. Or I had um, an agent when I was looking for Europe early on, I would send him a text. He would wait a week to respond, a text, nothing. Like I would check in every couple of weeks just to you know, see what's going on. At least even if he told me, hey, nothing's going on this week. I'm investigating this, this, and this. It would be better than him not responding to me. Exactly. And then we got another one prior to Europe where same kind of deal. This guy's telling me to reach out. So it's like, who's, who's doing what job. And so half the battle that I wanted to fix was making sure that parents who, some parents who aren't very educated on hockey, who want the best for their kid, that their investment in an advisor is well worth it. Yeah. Because if not, it almost feels like you're stealing money from people when you're not working for them properly. I totally agree with that. And that's a big driver as to why I kind of started the company too. And and Mm -hmm. I'm doing it as well is because I've had, I've had one great advisor in the past and junior was later towards my career, but then I had two like pretty bad ones. Like same thing as you, 
you send them a text or you give them a call, you don't hear from them for like two weeks. And unfortunately, like a lot happens in two weeks, right? You don't, you oh, don't yeah. have that, that kind of time. Like, I think as an advisor, you should respond at, at the very max, like within 24 hours, you know, mm-hmm. especially if it's your client. Like, you know, it's, I think it's, you know, if they, like you said, if they text you and they say, Hey, is there any updates or whatever, even if you have nothing, just say, listen, nothing yet. We're investigating this and that. And just by doing that, it puts him at ease. Like at least like he's working for me type thing. You know? Right. Exactly. They're, they're paying us a lot, like a, a good chunk of money for it. So I think if you're taking that money, you better deliver on the service. You know, that's yeah. just my mindset with it. No, a hundred percent. And having, having the ease of mind, like on when you're the client is, is something that's really important. Like when I was, um, when I was trying to get to Italy, I was having like a tough time. And so, you know, you wake up in the morning and you flip your phone over, hoping to see a message from somebody, your advisor, whoever it might be. And you check in, no answer, no answer, no answer. And it's annoying. And people do that sometimes. And so, I mean, I try to keep my communication as best as I can. So other people don't have the same experience that I do. 100%. Yeah, I think that's a good reason, reason why to do it. You know, it's, it's a a good driving force for me. And I think, uh, I think it's important, you know, that we understand why we're doing something. Uh, What, what do you think are are the main roles that, that an advisor kind of does for a player? That's, That's a, that's a good question. We get that a lot too. I get that a lot on the Instagram. So as, as your advisor, what I tell everyone, clients, prospective clients, where your marketer, your mentor, and the person that you go to, if you need help with, with any area that's um, of issue during your search. So for example, a Canadian client trying to go down to U S to play junior, what's the visa situation? What's the insurance? What's my billet situation look like? Um, ice time. How does he get to the rink? How does he eat? What's the process for travel, et cetera? Because as a parent and as a player, you're concerned about how your kid's going to be living. You want them to live a good lifestyle and they're all valid questions. So an advisor should be able to take care of all that for you. Because if not, what are you doing? You're just contacting the team and then you leave the rest of it up to up to the parent to figure out when they don't have a clue, which is why they hire you in the first place. Yep. So it's not just about placing guys on teams. It's about knowing the ins and outs of, of what they have to get, um, even trying to negotiate costs down because junior hockey is getting more expensive. College hockey too. You can talk to the coaches, see what the school can do for you. So you have to be well-rounded almost as like a, you're a consultant. That's uh, you have to know every detail that goes into your contracts, placing your players and, and just figuring out what's best for your clients. Yeah, for sure. I think that you hit it right on the nail. So I think like you're, you're, a, you can't call ourselves agents, but basically that's <laughs> kind of what you do. You know, it's similar work in that aspect. You're a marketer in a way, and you're also their mentor. Like you're there to answer whatever questions they have. Yeah. Yeah, the billet situation, do all, all those logistics, like you're there to help them through the process, you know, and mm-hmm. coaches will help us too. Like when, when a player signs with a team, like they'll help organize those things, but we communicate with the coaches. We tell the parents what's going on. If they have any questions, we answer them and all that. Absolutely. Stuff. Yeah. So that's, that's the main roles. Also too, you mentioned that we negotiate down and that that's a, a big part that a lot of people don't know. Uh, but basically what we do is like, and teams will probably hate us for putting this on the air, but you know, we, we try and negotiate down the best possible deal for people. So in a way they, they invest in us, but, you know, hopefully we're able to, not always, but hopefully we're able to negotiate the, uh, the deal down a little bit with different junior teams. Mm-hmm. That way it saves the parents money because it yeah. is going to be expensive. Like you said, it is, but I don't think it's a bad thing for people to know. I mean, the teams know it, they yeah. you, obviously you don't put the team names out there, but Teams have a, they have their price, which is fine because they need to fill their own quota to make a, re, to generate revenue and do that. But then they do have that wiggle room yeah. where if a guy needs the help and they really want the player, they can make that exception. hundred percent. And that's, that's important yeah. for parents to know. For sure. mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Cause I've had guys, you know, when we knock the price down for guys, it's great. But in the past, I've talked to a guy, he told me he paid almost $20,000 tuition to play junior. I'm like, well, if you maybe had an advisor, that team wouldn't have, taking that much money from you. Yeah. Cause they would have understood. They know, they know what they're doing. Like I said, they're open to the, to the negotiation because it's a part of everything. You know, even pro agents negotiate contracts with their clients. They know what they can do. Yeah. But if you have someone helping you who knows the business, it'll help you even more to get that cost down. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. All right. So as an advisor, what are the top three, like let's start with the on ice stuff. So what are the top three on ice things you look for in a player? Before I start with the top three on ice skills, the one thing that I will say, which I encounter so often, is you as a player have to recognize your role, where you can go for the following season. Hmm. I get, and look, this 
whether this causes friction or not. I get so many guys reaching out saying, Hey, I want to go to the USHL, to the BCHL, to this, to that, to the null. I'm like guys, you have to look at your resume and see, are you actually fit for that at the moment? Because as an advisor, I learned, okay, when someone sends you a resume blindly, you look at it and you wonder, okay, what value does this have to another team? These players have to think about the coaches that receive tons of emails a day, tons of calls. What on your resume is going to stick out that they're going to want you? Because if you have four points in, in 30 games, why do you deserve to be in the USHL mm-hmm. more than all? And it's a tough question to ask somebody, but you, you but can't get it so often that you got to be realistic. It's the it's, truth. It's the truth. Unfortunately, like it's, it's the way it is. Like, you know, if, if, you, like you said, if you have four points in 30 games in, in an okay, you know, triple A league or a lower end junior league, it, it's, you can't, not, make, yeah. you can't make that jump, you know, and mm-hmm. it, it's true. I, I get it too. And you have to be, you know, you don't want to break a guy's spirits. You just have to be honest. You have to tell him, listen, those leagues are, it's probably not realistic. Here are some leagues to look at, you know, so, something like that. Exactly. And it's not a question of breaking their spirits. You know, I don't tell the guys, Hey, you're not good enough. It's yeah. more so, Hey, I think your resume is fit for this. Like you said, for example, if you're, <clears throat> if you're a tier three junior player and you get half a point a game in tier three junior, and you want to go to tier two in the null, if you can't produce, if you can't be a top producer there, what makes you think at the next level, they're going to want you to be a top producer there. It's just, it's hockey's competitive and it's, it, it gets more cutthroat as you get older. So I want, I hope whoever's watching it can hear that because no one cares about you as, as bad as that may sound. The older you get, the less you get cared about and the more it's about your performance slash development. Mm. But some of these coaches, they, they like to bring guys to camp for the money and these kids think they have a chance, but they have to be realistic with themselves and yeah. see what's out there. That's a whole other issue. That's yeah, but we, we won't get into that. But getting back to the on-ice skills, <clears throat> hockey IQ is a big one for me. Being able to skate, um, showing that you have a, a solid work ethic on the ice. And then I'll throw a fourth one in because it can vary from player to player. Whatever your, your niche skill is, make sure that you can showcase it because you have to have something that stands out uh, above the rest. Everyone can skate at the good junior levels. Most people are pretty smart, but if you need something that can really stand out, whether that's you're being an exceptional skater. You have a great shot. You can throw the body. You're a great passer. You need something. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because coaches oftentimes when they fill their their lineup, and I, I've seen it now, like more on the advising side, they are very specific as to what they want. And if sometimes they'll be like, hey, I want a, uh, a goal scorer, a guy can really shoot the puck. Or I want a guy that can quarterback the, the power play on the fence, you know, thing, things like that. They're very specific. So mm-hmm. if you can really find, if that's your niche, if you're a power forward and you drive the net, or if you're a D that can quarterback the power play, if that's your niche, get really good at that because by doing that, it makes you, um, it just makes you more valuable. It makes you stand out and that's how coaches are going to end up picking you. You don't mm-hmm. want to be, well, you can be a well-rounded player. That's good. But typically from my experience, what I've seen is guys who really stand out in one or two areas. That's what coaches uh, gravitate towards more. Yep, yeah. exactly. And I'll say this, if you do want to play professional down the road, you will need to fit yourself into a role Yeah. because there's not, there's not a, a top six role for everybody. There's you can be an unbelievable third liner. You can be in this, this or that. You know, I had a coach tell me <laughs> just recently, Dave, like you're probably a better third liner in a higher league than a top six forward in a lower league which is fine. If that's what fits my skills and that's, that's the role, but I accept that. And you have to know what your role is because if you're not a top goal scorer, then you're not a top six and that's all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's true. Like moving on to character skills here. So if you had to pick three, three, like character traits of a player, what do you think you would uh, gravitate towards? Being humble, being coachable and having a desire to self-improve with, with no external motivation. Uh, being humble again goes back to what we said knowing about knowing where you stand in the lineup where you think you fit and what your top skills are Um, being coachable means being obviously able to adapt to what your coach says not taking criticism too harshly and then being self-motivated and wanting to get better every day that's just the only way that you're going to get better because if someone's going to push you to do it then you you don't really want to do it where do you think that inner drive comes from the self-motivation Ooh, that's a good question. I'm not a psych major, but uh, <laughs> it comes from you having a future plan and truly wanting to get that, to achieve that goal. Some guys want to play pro be, just to tell people they play pro or play college, whatever it is. But if you want to do it for yourself, then you'll find it. Mm-hmm. If you're doing it to impress others, to impress your friend, your family, your friends, a girl, whatever the case may be, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Yeah. I think having a good reason why is, is, 
honestly, that usually the driving force behind what we, what we do, you know, mm-hmm. if you don't have that strong reason why the path is so hard, especially if you're coming from lower end, like college or whatever, and, and, and okay career, and you're trying to make it through the pro it's such a difficult uh, path that if you don't have a strong reason why as to why you're doing it, it's, it, it really, it'll discourage you. You know, it's, you really need that strong reason why to push through all that adversity. Exactly. Yeah. I know you're really into fitness. So I want to touch on this too, before we end the interview, what are, what are maybe like the top three, you know, drills that, that players should, or off ice things that players should focus on in uh, their off season and the on season as well. I'll, I'll say this. Instagram is covered with fancy or social media in general is covered with fancy exercises. Do this to build your speed, do a jump with four bands and a dumbbell drop, et cetera, <laughs> whatever. It's so true. true. <laughs> There's two key things. One is a consistent plan where every week you're progressively either improving your weight or improving the speed. And when you're actually moving these weights and doing these exercises, if you're not focusing on the muscles you're using, they are, you're not going to progress as fast. So when I'm work, when I'm working out, a muscle, I'm thinking about the muscles that I'm working on and making sure that I'm using them properly. For hockey players, long distance running is a no-go. Short sprints, shuttle runs, things like that. Think about your game. You know, you're a 30, 40 second shift off the ice, two minute, two and a half minute rest back out there. You need to train somewhat in terms of how how the game's played. If you're a marathon runner, sure, you go for long runs, but hockey is a quick, fast twitch on and off sport. So you got to think about it like that. Yeah. The, the point that you mentioned, like really focus on your muscles. I, I remember a few trainers told me that, but a lot of players don't think about that. And that's, that's super important. So, so basically you're saying when you're working out, like, let's say you're, I don't know, you're doing lunges or whatever. You really want to focus on the, the muscle, like the, the contraction and making sure you're doing a full contraction, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Cause if not, you're just moving your body around. Yeah. That's and you're compensating other places. I mean, I did the training a few years ago with, with the gym here and you know, I was teaching the younger kids, like, this is what you got to focus on. Think about the muscle, think about it. It makes um, an entire world of difference in terms of your training. Yeah. I've noticed that too, actually. And sometimes I have to, you know, catch myself and remind myself to like focus back on contracting mm-hmm. muscle. But when you do, like you notice a huge difference at the end of yep. your you're working. Massive. Awesome. So, all right. One last question for you, Dave. And it's a question that I ask everyone at the end is what's one last piece of advice you'd like to give to young players out there that you would have liked to have when you were younger? I would say <clears throat> never think you're too late for, for the process, have a plan and have, have a plan as to where you want to be and, and the steps that you need to take in order to get there and find your biggest strength and utilize it as, you know, the driving factor to surround your other strengths yeah. and that'll help your career a lot. So if I wasn't fast, my career would be nowhere. Mm-hmm. Bottom line, if you're a skill guy, use your skills to what you can do and build your other skills around that in order to round out your game, uh, make yourself more noticeable and more, more dynamic and marketable as a player with more assets and just bring everything you can to the table, but make sure that you do have those factors that stand out among the rest. Yeah. So really filling that niche as a player is, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's great. Advice. So yeah. great way to finish here, Dave. I know you're a busy guy. You got a lot of phone calls to make a lot of clients to talk to. So Oh, I'll leave yeah. you to it, but thanks so much for your time and for coming on the podcast here. Yep. Awesome. Absolutely. Pearls all. We'll get to right. get that going later. All right. All right. Take care. Take care. All right, guys, that is it for the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this content here. I always enjoy talking to Dave. That's why I have him as the lead role on my team here. I think he's a great guy and a great person to talk to. And he's a great person with a a lot of knowledge in the hockey world. So if you guys have any questions for me or for Dave, especially for Dave here about, um, you know, anything related to hockey, to college hockey, pro hockey, advising, anything like that, feel free to drop a comment below. Or if you want to, you can send us a private email at info at ahadvising.com and we'll get back to you as soon as you can on that too. Also too, if you enjoyed the video here, if you like this content, if you got value out of this interview, consider destroying that like button if you haven't already. It really goes a long way. And consider hitting that subscribe button and notification bell so you never miss another video moving forward here. All right guys, that is it for the video. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching and we'll catch you on that next one.